right. Y'all ready for the word? What are we what are we discussing here? What are we talking about? What yeah, everything. What book are we in? All right. All right. I tell you what, before I get started, that, that one song, you know, just talking about the, the love of God, before we get into this message, do you know that this morning? Do y'all know how much God loves you? And I mean, some of us, I know some of y'all don't, don't relate to this, but some of us, we carry a lot of mistakes in our mind. Things that we just are ashamed of. We disappointed God. I know some of y'all don't know what that's like, but some of you that do, doesn't it mean a lot to know that God still loves you? You know, it, it, it just, it makes me love Him more and more to know how much He has forgiven me and how much He loves me. And, and you, should, you should know that. I wanted to encourage you with that this morning. So anyway, let's get back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're learning about the end times. What's the next big scene, as I told the young people? Nobody, you know, since the days of Christ, since He ascended, and, you know, of course, the apostles did signs and wonders you know, to establish the church so people would believe that everything that these guys were doing was truly from God. Because as John says, there were many antichrists. People have been going for thousands of years, spreading out, telling you who Jesus is. All kinds of different thoughts out there. And people believe it. I mean, you can look at oneness Pentecostalism. It, it denies the Trinity, and they got 24 million followers. And they talk about Jesus, right? The Catholic Church. The Mormons. The Jehovah's Witness. We can go on and on and on with the people who talk about Jesus, but it's not biblical. And I want you to be clear as, we're, as we really go through this that you must understand that Jesus said there's go, that not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, he said there will be many who say Lord. And he says, I never knew you. Who are those people? They are the people that were believing in a false Jesus. They were believing in, in lies. And they were trapped in it. And they thought they were okay. But they weren't. But I wanted, I'm sharing with you this morning where we're at in this passage. Is that the truth has always been there. It's always been there. And God says that all of the people in all of humanity are without excuse. Nobody will stand at the great white throne judgment and have an excuse. Time out, God. Uh, I lived in Taiwan, and I didn't know this. God said, in church, this is very, very important. It doesn't matter what you think or what you feel. It matters what God said. And God said clearly in His Word, because He is the only objective standard of truth. Okay, Everything you feel and think or whatever is subjective. There is no absolutes to it. There can be. Like, I know my name, right? I'm pretty absolutely sure my parents gave it to me, put it on the birth certificate. But what God said is absolute truth. It's not subjective. And, and God wants us to understand these things. He wants us to know who Jesus is. He wants us to be clear. And I want you to know, as I said last week, and I felt like stressing again this week, that Paul is comforting these Christians at Thessalonica comforting now stress to you have you ever comforted someone with the word of God with the promises of God get in the habit of being an encourager and being a comfort okay God didn't give you a bullwhip and stone we are to go around right with love trying to rescue people that's your attitude rescuing people from the flames of hell that are coming well Paul is comforting these, Thess these Christians at Thessalonica. And what's he comforting them with? That the day of the Lord has not come. The day of the Lord, as I've been telling you, is Old Testament prophecies about what the judgment of God that's to come. Now, they saw many judgments of God. You go back to the Old Testament, it's filled with judgment. We saw Assyria come in and conquer, you know, conquer the northern kingdom. 700 B.C., right? And then another 100 years later, Babylon comes in and wipes out the southern kingdom. So all of the Israelites, the Jewish people, were scattered. And they've never come back together. Until 1945, we gave them some, you know, America, the Allied forces, you know, great, we gave them that land and they're moving back to Jerusalem, but they still do not occupy 
the entire land that God had promised to them. They don't occupy it all. And, and most importantly, in prophetic language, they are not living in peace and safety. If someone argues with you that the Jewish people are living in peace and safety, I think I don't even know what to say to them. I mean, why do you think they have the Iron Dome system over there? They're constantly having to shoot down rockets. Their girls carry machine guns to school. So they, for, 2000, or for thousands of years, have not lived in peace and safety. But God promises in Zechariah and Ezekiel and that, you know, that there's going to be a restoration. These people are going to live in peace and safety when the Lord Jesus returns. And that's where we're at. We're looking at the time we call the seven years of tribulation, which is just before Jesus comes back. Okay. Now, he's comforting the church about this, that you guys are not going to experience the seven years of tribulation. If you're sitting here today and you're not born again, you think you might be saved, you're not real sure, well, you're probably not. I'll just tell you that. Because when you're born again, when you're saved, it is, you're a whole new creation. And I'm going to say something at the end today that will really help you evaluate that. But it's so, if you are a Christian, you won't experience these final seven years of tribulation because God has promised, He's comforting us with these words that we are not children of wrath or children of darkness. We're not going to experience the wrath of God. The wrath of God is different than the persecution of the world. Okay? You're taking notes. That's a big one to remember. We are going to suffer persecution as Christians. If you're not suffering persecution now, it's probably because they don't know you're a Christian. But when you begin to share with people that you are a Christian and you're teaching them what Jesus said, they are going to hate you. They do not want to hear about your Jesus and your restraint over their sin. Okay? That's different than the wrath of God. When God starts pouring out the seal judgment, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments, it's beyond anything that humans have ever seen. And I'll make a comment about that later, about the third of the ocean turning into blood. You can't even imagine. A third of the fresh water, poison. No more fishing. We're done with that. Can you imagine that? Right? Nick's like, just take me on now, right? Don't make me live through that. The Antichrist is coming. That's what we've been talking about the last few weeks. He comes at the beginning of the seven years. He's revealed to the people were all, that they know who he clearly is to the Jewish people at the three and a half year mark. Okay? As I've been telling you, this final week of Daniel's 70th week, this is to the Jewish people. The church is gone. Now, there will be Gentiles in the world that get saved during the seven years of tribulation, but mostly it's going to be the Jewish people. Okay? 144,000 of them are going to go out preaching the gospel. We missed it. Jesus was the Messiah. We were wrong. And they're going to mourn. Why are they mourning? Because you go back for how many centuries of all of their, the people that they've known and loved before went to hell. That's what they're mourning over. Okay? This Antichrist that comes on the scene is revealed at the three and a half year mark of the final seven years is controlled by Satan and he has great power and here's the key word to deceive the unbelievers. That's what he does. That's literally what his name means, the deceiver. Okay? You could be sitting here today and be, and be deceived. Someone has deceived you through a false message. Someone has come to these Thessalonians telling them, you're in the day of the Lord. And they were believing it. Okay? They were deceived. Paul's comforting us. No, you're not in the day of the Lord. Because it won't come until the apostasy and the rebellion. These things must come first. Jesus tells us about the end of it in Matthew 24. We've not seen those things, okay? Some of people are going to argue and say, well, no, he's wrong. We saw that in 70 AD. But here's where you prove them wrong. And I keep telling you this over and over because it's very important. Nobody in 70 AD made a seven-year covenant with the Jewish people. And also, the Jewish people are not living in peace and safety. You can hang your hat on that, and I promise you, you can go to any university, any seminary in this country, and they cannot argue with you on that. They cannot show you someone that made a seven-year pact with the Jewish people. You're like, Derek, why are you so passionate about that? Because I don't like division in the church. There's no sense in it. You take a dumb little country boy like me, and I can figure that out. The rest of you can too. The Bible's clear that this Antichrist is going to make a seven-year pact with the many. Daniel, it tells us that. Nobody did that. 
Some people are going to say, well, Jesus did that. Show me where Jesus, in the Bible, where Jesus made a seven-year covenant. Never. Nowhere in Scripture. Not even symbolically. He made an eternal covenant in his blood. Show me where Titus Vespucci, the Roman general that came in and, and destroyed uh, Jerusalem in 70 AD, made a seven-year covenant. He did not. All he did was kill them all. He didn't make a covenant with them. And he did not, and he still worshiped the gods of his father, the Greek god. This Antichrist does not honor the gods of his father. Okay, now I'm purposely giving you a lot of scripture. I did take you through the book of Daniel where I taught all of this. You can get on YouTube and go back and listen. But I'm just giving you little points here to kind of let you know that we can be comforted with this word of God about the end time. Okay, We're, it's not a confusing, a confusing thing. You can know if you apply yourself to it. But these unbelievers that are, in, that are alive during that time, they're blinded by Satan today. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 tells us that the God of this world, the little G God, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the glorious gospel. Okay? That's what Satan has done. And they're, he's going to continue to do that. And in the end times, they're going to easily follow him. Why? Why do they keep following the lies of Satan? This is our question today. And the reason why is because they don't want the truth. People don't want the truth. I mean, if you remember the movie, you don't want the truth, right? You can't handle the truth, right? They don't want the truth. So here's the question today. What do they want? What do your friends and family, your co-workers, people you know that are not in Christ, what do they want? And that's what I'm going to start off with today before we get to our two verses we're studying. Why won't they come to Jesus? So follow with me here through a few passages of Scripture that you need to highlight really in your Bibles. You, need, you guys will use these often. Often. If you're witnessing like you're supposed to be. John 3, 19 to 20. This is why they won't come. This is why your friends and family will not get on board with Jesus. Like you have. This is the judgment. That the light has come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light. There's your answer. They love the darkness. For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil gets, watch this, hates the light. Now who's the light? Jesus said, I'm what? The light of the world. Everyone who does evil, guess what? Hates the light. Did it say it's confused about the light? Does it say indifferent towards the light? No, what does it say? Hates. What did Jesus say? They hated me. And they will what? They will hate you. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. We don't want to give up our sin, do we? We love it. We don't want to give it up. Now the big one, Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. I used that last week. I'm using it again. You can't suppress something that you don't know. So that's a key part to understand about your friends and family who won't believe, who won't come. They are suppressing the truth. Meaning they know the truth, but they suppress it. They don't, want, they don't want to talk about it. Leave me alone about it, right? Obviously, they're not knocking down the, the doors of the church every, in this county to get in, are they? Because they want to suppress the truth. They don't want to hear it. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. I look at these little children around here, and it reminds me, every time I study this, I think about these little children and that smile and love. Of course, some of you are like, well, talking about they weren't too smiling this morning but y'all generally know they tend to have a disposition about them that's just beautiful isn't it? i mean i can remember looking at my little girl and i was so mad i was going in there to pop her bottom because she wouldn't quit crying quit, quit waking up she wouldn't go to sleep but then she had this big giggle on her face and i just melted you know and i couldn't help it. but that you know there's this love of god that's just that's 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 his attributes are put within us right so that everything about god he says here is evident within them for God made it evident to them, for since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Underline that. Being understood through that, through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Don't let people try to tell you, come up with human reasoning or psychology. What did God say? He said they're without excuse. Why? Because they suppressed the truth. They knew it. They knew God. Watch this. For even though they knew God, 
All your people that you're worrying about praying for, they do know God. There's no such thing as an atheist. That is a lie. They know God. But watch this. They did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. That's what they want. And worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. This is big time in our world right now. Look in many of our churches. That's what it really the root of it is. It's what we call man-centered theology. I want to know what God can do for me. Why? Because I worship this creature instead of the creator. I want it to be all about me. And guess what? Boy, there's so many preachers out there, Bible teachers. They will tell you all of these wonderful things that God is going to do for you. Terry, did you know for $9.99 you could get a little prayer cloth? And buddy, that back, that neck would be healed. Where's your prayer cloth? Why ain't you bought one yet? Because you know different, don't you? Right? But there's people out there, and they they and the reason they fall into that, guys, that man-centered theology is because they worship the creature and not the creator. They make it all about them. 90% of the people who walk away from the church, that's why they walked away. Because something wasn't making them happy. Somebody didn't talk to them, or somebody didn't do this right or that right. See, it's all about them. They're in a mindset of worshiping the creature instead of the creator. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. And that's going to be our theme for today. That God can do stuff like this, guys. This is what he's done. He gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. You get that? Don't let people argue with you over that. Brandon Peterson, these guys that's come out there, it's got millions of followers on Facebook and all over the world that's trying to tell you God didn't say anything about homosexuality or sexual immorality. He meant loving relationship. He just wants you to be in a loving relationship. And don't listen to the church down there judging you. They're just haters. You want to hear how Satan talks? That's how he talks. That's how he communicates through people like that. The Bible says it clear right here that God gave them over to these degrading passions. The women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural and in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer God gave them over to a depraved mind literally means a no mind we see that very evident today when people actually believe they can be another gender or even an animal okay this is the progression sexual immorality once you start down that road there's never a satisfaction to it they're going to keep chasing the next thing right until they, they just keep on chasing God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper being filled with all unrighteousness wickedness greed evil full of envy murder strife deceit malice they are gossips slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, see there again, they know the law of God, that those who pra practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Now you'll know why when you get into the next chapter, he starts saying things like, who are you, old man, to judge each other? You're doing the same things they're doing. So look at how God has made himself known. If you look back through this whole Bible, through the thousands of years since creation, and even with all of the evidence, all of the knowledge of God, all of the attributes of God that have been clearly seen through creation, 
We look at the miracles. We look at the prophecies. Over 300 and something prophecies that came true. The inspired word of God was given to us. That never contradicts itself. 66 books written by 40 different men over a thousand years of time on two different continents. And they're fishermen and sheep herders and they never contradict each other. Give me a break. This is absolute truth. The burden's on you to prove one part of it and wrong. You No man's ever done it, so good luck. So God has made himself known through all of these examples I've given you, yet it's still obvious today that men don't want him. They don't believe. But Psalm 14 says, look on the screen, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. Now watch this church. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. A key part of understanding, you want to know why the church is so split up? Right here is a big part of it. There, he wants to know if there's any who seek after God. Paul explains to us in Romans 3, what? There's none who seek after God. The natural man understands not the things of God, for they are foolish to him. Your friends and family who don't care, they're not out there seeking after God. But we just read, they know who God is, but they're suppressing him. Because God has said, thou shalt not do this, and thou shalt not, and they don't want to hear all of that. Leave me alone. Right? So they suppress that. They don't seek after God. It says there that David said, they have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There's no one who does good not even one. Mankind will always go after what he wants. Philippians 2.21, he says, For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. They say to God in Job 21, I love this one, they say to God, Depart from us. We do not even desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what would we gain if we entreat him? What's he going to give me? What's he going to do for me? See, they're worshiping the creature instead of the creator. So now that we've put things in right perspective, because I learned in studying this, this, this whole deal about the deluding influence and the Antichrist and all this stuff, if we don't truly go back and understand the nature of man, the total depravity of man, the lostness of man, we won't understand what he's saying here. So we need to go back and build a good solid foundation on what is wrong with men. What's wrong is they don't want God. The light is coming to the world, as I read you, but men love the darkness. They don't want to go to the truth. Well, he's showing us here the final results. God is going to finally have enough, guys. He's already told us the end of the book, right? We don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but we know that God is fixing to drop the hammer. He's had enough. He's going to put an end to it all day. One day, there's going to be an end. And let's see what God does in the end, in this passage, to all of those who suppress the truth and choose. Write this down. They choose to love a lie. Look at our television. Is it not proof? Has the stage not been set? How many of, how many of us would much rather sit and watch some lie, my mammy used to call it. Y'all don't, you boys be quiet, I gotta watch my lie. You know, God and light and all that, she wanted to watch her lie. We love it. We'd much rather do that than sit in a Bible study class with somebody, right? It's just easy. Pull the blanket up, just disappear into my life. That's what we like. That the stage is set right now for this Antichrist to come in and to deceive people. Because he's going to give them what? Exactly what they want. Watch this. Verse 11 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and 12. For this reason, because of all of these... For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. For this reason, here's the question, why would God send a deluding influence on them so they believe what is false? Why would God send a deception, a deceiving influence, a deluding influence? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. Look back in your Bibles there. And with all the deception of unrighteousness for those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive 
the love of the truth so as to be saved. That's why. Why would God send them? They don't want the truth. They would not come to the truth. Jesus cried, literally cried tears. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks. But what? You would not listen. You would not come. Because they would not believe. Now, I want you to be clear, church. It's not that they could not believe. The issue is they would not believe. Okay? Now, notice it says that God will sin. That means judgment. God is sending a deluding influence. This is God's judgment over sin. Do you know that God has a right to enact His judgment? How many of you believe that? If you don't, you need to believe it today because I'm telling you, that's what God, God is God. He's sovereign. He can do whatever He wants to do, right? But God is enacting His judgment on them for their unbelief. And God can do that at any time. God tells us clearly in His Bible, the soul that sinneth shall surely die. That's in Ezekiel 18. God said in Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death. The Bible tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We need to be clear today that God could have killed every one of us already and been perfectly justified. He could stop the oxygen right now. And no one on, on the planet could say he's an unjust God. Isn't that what people want to do all the time? God's unfair. God's unjust. Why does God allow this to happen? Why does God allow that to happen? And you should stop them right there and say, let me ask you something. Or let me tell you something. You're asking the wrong question. There's only one question you should be asking God. Why did you save anybody? Because every one of us deserved an eternal damnation because we didn't want you. We didn't want what you gave us to do. We didn't want your way of living. We want our way of living. I want to be left alone to do what I want to do. And then you're like, well, I want to be with Jesus forever. Why do you want to be with Jesus forever? You've spent your whole life telling him you didn't want what he has. Can't have your cake and eat it too. You know what men were like before the flood? Because remember, God's already enacted his judgment one time, didn't he? He wiped out the whole planet. And be clear, because there's people out there, I was talk, uh, debating with a guy this week, listening to a, a pastor, a popular pastor, Timothy Keller, I'll name names, he does not believe that there was a worldwide flood. Now you really have to twist the scripture. I immediately had to go to Genesis 6 and 7 and read it all. And slowly read it. And it says clearly, everything that God created that had the breath of life was destroyed. Is that not, I mean, you, do, we, do you need to go to a seminary to understand that? It's crystal clear. Everything that God created that had the breath of life. Go read Genesis 7. There was a worldwide flood. The boat, the ark floated above, the, the water went 15 cubits above the highest mountains on the earth. He put that in there for a reason. Everything was underwater. Right? In a long time. They were on that boat for a year. What were men like before the flood? Like, watch this, Genesis 6, 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. They think there's two to four billion people on the planet then, okay? I don't know if that's true or not, but if what they've done is mathematics. You look at the birth rate, okay? You see how many, starting from Adam and Eve, you do the count, and if you did birth rates, you kind of, it's a mathematical thing. So they estimate. So let's just say it was a billion. If you say, well, I don't, it couldn't have been four billion. Well, it's a billion. Is that enough people to get your attention? God wiped out at least a billion people. Okay, maybe you choose the 765 million version. It doesn't matter. God wiped out 765 million people in the flood. I, I tend to think it was more. But what were they like? It says here, God saw that wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You see the nature of man? Now you know why we tell you when you're preaching the gospel to people, start with the total depravity of man. The only inclinations of his mind and his heart is evil. That's what he wants. You don't have to worry about from the time your children are born, and especially some of you right now with these young children, you know good and well they're little sinners, don't you? 
foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child. That's why the Bible says the rod of correction drives it far from them, right? They don't want to do what's right. They want to do what they want to do. You try telling them no and see what they do. The Bible tells us in, in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Now, God does not, here, write this down for me, please, and, or remember it clearly. God does not cause their unbelief. I'll say that again, especially for you out there on the, in the uh, internet world. God does not cause their unbelief. But what he's doing is he's giving them the opportunity to manifest it, to show it, to prove their unbelief. He's giving them the opportunity to do that. And I want you to be clear as we're learning here, God is going to judge them by the very lies that they chose to embrace in life. He's going to judge them by that. He gives them over to the consequences of their continual choice to reject Christ. He's going to give them over. All you ever, here's what he's saying to you at the great white throne judgment. You're here today and you're not saved. You don't care. He's going to tell you. He's, it's like he's saying this. You know what, man? All you ever wanted was a lie. That's all you ever wanted. So guess what? I give you what you wanted. That's what I'm giving to you. You want to believe Satan? Trust his way? Then that's what I'm giving you. He turned them over. And now I'm going to make it to a point here. He's saying in 2 Thessalonians, when he sends out a deluding influence, deluding influence over the minds of the unbelievers, he's going to make it so that's all they can do is believe a lie. Right now, today, you have the ability to hear the truth of the gospel. And repent, turn from your sin and take up the cross and follow Christ. But one day soon, when he, when he does this, when he sends that deluding influence out, you won't be able to do that. He's going to harden you like he did Pharaoh. He's going to harden you in that unbelief. You're going to be stuck in it. And you will not be able to believe anything but a lie. That's what he's saying. Some people might come up to you and say, well, you know what, if all this stuff is true and that rapture happens, well, that's when I'll believe. When I see all these people floating in the sky, all right, you've got my attention then. This is the verse you take them to. They think they're going to get believed after that. Say, no, you won't. You know why? Because God's going to send a deluding influence out so that you will only believe a lie. Guess what the stage has already said? I've been telling you for weeks. It was aliens. I mean, we've been having this stuff floating up in the sky, right? That's aliens interacting with us. They're trying to already deceive people. They're already Netflix shows and stuff. They're already getting you prepared that the rapture was just a, we've been knowing about it. We've been expecting it. And look, they're just up there on, on, on another planet. We know where they're at. We've got the Hubble telescope showing us where they're at. They'll come up with, and you know what? If you just pay a million dollars, we'll get on Elon Musk's uh, spaceships and we'll fly up there. We'll take you there. I can see how stuff like that would come and people will believe it. Just like today, people are believing it's okay to reject Jesus Christ and his church. They believe it's okay. They're fine. Just like I read to you in the days before the flood. Noah preached for 120 years. Did you know that? The man preached for 120 years. He was 600 years old when he went into the ark. Preached for 120 years. How many of the people were flocking there to get on the boat with him? Only his three sons and their wives and his wife. That's it. Eight people out of billions that came on that ark. And also, when they come to you and say, well, I'll believe then. Also, alongside of this deluding influence, guess what Jesus said is going to happen at that same time? Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. So maybe you're sitting here today and say, you know what? I'll believe then. Well, guess what you're fixing to run into? You're going to run down there to a church. There's going to be somebody standing there telling you who Jesus is. Somebody standing there saying, I, I'm him, I've come. Remember, your Bible says I'm come, and here I am. Come follow me, and you'll believe it. You'll believe it, and you'll follow along. That's what he's saying. So no, don't put off to that. Don't put that off because you don't have the power. And then secondly, you need to understand that it's the Spirit that gives life. You don't come to Jesus just because you want to. You come to Jesus because he drew you to him. Why? Because your heart, because you're a dead sinner and you have no desire to come to God. You won't seek after God. What's happening to you, maybe you're not saved today, you hear somebody like me preaching this word, and what the Spirit is doing is He's convicting your heart. 
And you're like, you know what? I feel terrible. I don't think I'm going to heaven. I think I'm going to hell. I've missed it. I'm living in sin. I'm doing things, you know, all of these things. And it's convicting your heart. The Bible says that it, the word is like a, a two-edged sword. And it's piercing into you. And it hurts. Have any of you ever been stabbed with a sword? I don't think so. I haven't. I've been stabbed with a knife and stuff, and it hurts, you know. But when it comes in there, he says it pierces open, and when that happens, it hurts. How many of you ever had surgery? Did it feel better instantly when they closed you up? No, it hurt for days and days after that, didn't it? This is what's happening. It's a spiritual conviction. God is dealing with your heart. He's drawing you to him. He's convicting you, and I'm pleading with you today. When you feel that conviction, respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's only one way you respond to an almighty and sovereign God. And that's broken and bowed down, begging for mercy. Pleading with God to have grace and mercy upon you. Save my soul, Lord. Forgive me of my sin. That's all you got to do is cry out to Him. Confess right with your mouth. Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And guess what? You shall be saved. You don't have to go to seminary for two years to figure it all out. Just believe on what I just told you there. Well, many people today are deceived, and they're believing that they're going to heaven. It's going to be worse than the deception. It will be worse when the deception is uncontrolled. Remember we talked about that a few weeks ago, when, when the Holy Spirit is not restraining this evil, when He's not restraining this Antichrist, and He's just allowed a free reign through His man to do whatever He wants to do, and people are going to get this deluding influence, plus the power of Satan the miracle signs and wonders that this guy's going to do, people are going to believe it. And they're going to take his mark. At the three, Even there's going to be two witnesses that God brings forth just like I am, preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel. They kill these men in the street. They lay there for three days. They come back alive on live television for the whole world to see. And guess what? They still don't believe. There's an angel flying through the earth crying out, heralding out what Jesus said, yeah, they still won't believe. Why? Because of the deluding influence that God has sent out to trap them in their unbelief. He's sealing them in their unbelief. That's what you wanted was a lie. That's what I'm going to give you. But this, this deluding influence, guys, we're talking about, it's nothing new. If you were with us on Sunday night, we went through 1 Kings, because it's important that you study through the Bible, right, so you know it. You remember 1 Kings 22, 23. Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a deceiving spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. And the Lord has proclaimed disaster against you. There's this scene in heaven. O oh, Ahab, wicked king Ahab. And, and the Lord cries out and said, well, what, what are we going to do about Ahab? And this little spirit comes before the Lord and says, I'll go do something. He goes, well, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to put a deceiving spirit in the mouths of his prophets. Do you know how many deceiving spirits spirits that you've probably listened to in your life now you know why you come down here to this little church and this little guy stands up here and tells you study this because if you don't study it if you don't know it you will be deceived and you could be one of those people that's crying out Lord Lord I went to church I did this I did that I served he says I never knew you don't be deceived. Go read Matthew 13. Matthew 13, you're thinking, I know all of you are like, I know Matthew 13. That's where Jesus, they ask him the question, why do you talk to us in parables? And what was Jesus' answer? He said, it was given for you to understand, but not for them. Well, that sounds a little harsh, don't it? Why wouldn't they understand it? Because they don't want it. That's what he keeps telling you all through Scripture. They don't want me. They want a lie. So that's why he spoke to them in parables. You remember back when King Saul? King Saul was, you know, was on the throne. God sent what? An evil spirit to terrorize him. God did that. That's a sign of judgment. Why? Well, look what Saul was doing. If you keep continuing in sin, God's going to send a judgment upon you too. It's only by his mercy that we haven't been killed already, as I told you earlier. I don't know about y'all, but I'm thankful for His grace and mercy. I shouldn't be here today. How about Pharaoh? God hardened Pharaoh's heart, didn't He? How about Judas Iscariot? What did He do there? At the Lord's Supper, the final table, with all the twelve sitting there, Jesus Christ and His twelve disciples, 
he looked and said, Satan, do what you do. And Satan was right there at the table. And he entered into Judas Iscariot and he went and betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Satan, and one of his demons could be in this room today. Now be clear, Satan is not omnipresent. Satan can't be in all places at all times. He's not God. He's an angel. He can only be in one place at one time. But guess what he's got scattered out all over the world? Remember that third of the angels that was cast out with him? He's got demons. You know what most people are trying to teach you about Jesus? You know what the Bible calls most of these people you see on TV and stuff? It's doctrines of demons. That's what the Bible says most people are teaching. So don't be deceived. All these men back through time saw these miracles that God had performed, and yet what did they do? They rejected him. I think of the Jewish people still today, after all they've seen for thousands of years, they still reject that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Go ask a Jewish person today, how would you know if a man came today and said he's the Messiah, that he's from the tribe of Judah, that he's from the line of David? How would you know that? Because all of your records were destroyed in 70 AD. You have no records, no, geneal no genealogical records. How would you know that? And they're going to be like, hmm, I hadn't thought about that. Because all I was taught was just follow the 613 laws and you'll be okay. But they don't, they don't question things like that. If you get to meet an Orthodox, you ask them that. Because Jesus Christ was the last one that we knew, they knew and agreed with, that came from the, line, from the tribe of Judah. Because that's what the prophecy said. The scepter will not depart from Judah. That's who the Messiah was coming through. How I many of you remember the story of Judah? Remember Judah's two sons? They couldn't get, they, they died, and they leave this, leave this young girl here, a wife who hadn't, hadn't she had no child. So the, the lineage was not being carried on. She knew that that had to happen. Well, so here comes the youngest son up. Well, back then, they, you know, you brothers were supposed to take your brother's wife. If you, you know, if he died, you're supposed to take her and, and marry her and have children with her. I'm so glad they didn't. We don't do that no more. That'd just be weird, you know. But that's what they had to do back in that agrarian society. Well, guess what? This little boy ain't ready to have a baby. And then all of a sudden he gets old enough. He don't want to have a baby. So she disguises herself as a prostitute, stands on the side of the road, and here comes Judah, right? Sees the prostitute, decides, hey, you know, I need a prostitute today. And he takes the prostitute and has a child, and Jesus is from that lineage. Do you see how God can work through all of that? How about when they got off of the boat? Almost immediately, after almost a year sitting in that boat, or a little over a year and ten days, whatever it was, after getting off that boat, what's the first thing? You know, Noah, of course, makes a big sacrifice, and then he plants a vineyard, and then what does he do? He gets drunk. Gets drunk, lays naked in his tent, here comes his son in there. I don't, you know, and his son he disrespects him or whatever he does, and goes and laughs and gets his brothers to laugh at their father, whatever, and... Well, then immediately Noah wakes up and says, puts a curse on his, on his son, Canaan. And how many of you know from your Old Testament studies about the Canaanites? What kind of people were they? Terrible. So see, these men witnessed, these three men in Noah, they witnessed the miracle of God by destroying the whole earth and saving them, but immediately they turn and go back to what? To sin. I can go on and on all day with the whole Bible full of stories like that. By the way, if you want to get into this argument about this young earth, old earth, global worldwide flood, let me, let me tell you something very important in that discussion. Jesus believed in a worldwide flood. That settles it for me. If Jesus believed it, it's enough for me. I ain't challenging what Jesus believed. You know how I know Jesus believed it? Because the, that was already written. They already had the Septuagint by the time Jesus came along. That's the Old Testament scriptures translated into Greek. Jesus knew exactly what was in the 39 books of the Old Testament. He never corrected or take, took any of them out. He agreed with what they had canonized. So therefore what? I agree with everything that's in that Old Testament because Jesus did. And Jesus believed in a worldwide flood. Men who wanted, I know it's not, I know they could call it a second tier issue or whatever you want to call it. But guys, when people start going after little things like that, it makes me always suspect what else they'll go after. But go back to the scriptures. I want you to hear in closing. God's judgment is coming upon these people. Why? Because they did not believe the truth. It's not that they could not. It's that they would not. And God didn't cause that. 
but God is giving them exactly what they want. You want to believe a lie? There you go. That you're fixing to get filled up with them. I'm going to give you all of them you want. And then the final words, they took pleasure in wickedness. And I thought, I don't think I really have to explain a lot of that. That hit me in my studies. This I don't have to explain that to these guys. They took pleasure in wickedness. If you really don't know what that means, <laughs> I'd like to talk to you because I really I don't think I've ever met a, a human being that didn't take pleasure in their sin. Or you wouldn't have done it. It's kind of like me. I, with, I use, like to use beans as an example. You're not going to tempt me with beans. It ain't going to happen. You Sweet little ladies, I know y'all think you can put brown sugar on them and you can make them taste better than that. No, it ain't happening. I'm not going to eat it. I don't take any pleasure in it, right? But we take pleasure in our sin, don't we? So I got to ask you in closing today, just because I always want to do this. I never know who's sitting in an audience or who's listening. Has there been a time in your life where you mourned your sin? Jesus comes on the scene, his first sermon, first words out of his mouth in his first sermon was what? Blessed are the poor in spirit. And immediately after those words, what does he say? Blessed are those who mourn. Guys, he's talking about sin. Until you have mourned your sin, until you have realized that you are spiritually bankrupt, that there's no good in you, there's no reason that God should allow you into his heaven. Until you have come to that truth, and realize the desperate situation that you're in. You don't get to rise up and start questioning God. All you do is fall on your knees and beg Him for mercy. Because He has proven Himself. He's absolutely true. It's time you better mourn your sin. Because the day could come that He could harden you in your sin just like He did Pharaoh and all these other people I've listed. And send a deluding influence upon you and you won't be able to hear the truth. But that's why the Bible says clearly, today is the day of salvation. That sword just hit you in your heart this morning. You're thinking, man, I don't think I'm saved, Derek. I think something's missing. Hey, confess Jesus is Lord today. It's that simple. Turn from your sin. So how do I do that? Come walk with the rest of us. We're trying to figure it out too. <laughs> you ain't alone, all right? You're in good company. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we can know the truth. Father, even amongst uh, of all the false teachers that have been sent out into the world, all the antichrists that are out in the world, and Lord, we know that today that your spirit is working in the hearts of men and women still. And we can know the truth. Father, I hope that your word has gone out and pierced hearts of someone today that may not be born again, that, that, that you've used the word today to, to make them realize, don't put this off, that you must confess Jesus is Lord. You must believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. That He is the only way to heaven. And you must, you must, when I say confess His Lord, Lord, I pray that they understand that that means that He is there, as Brother Dave prayed this morning, our Master, our Lord. And Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. I'm not going to be like these people who don't want to do what you want. I want to do what you want. Lord, I pray that everybody in this room know what, knows what it means to mourn their sin. Lord, some of, sometimes I think here, and especially living in this country that you've blessed us with, that we are so blessed, that we are so comfortable, that we are actually walking and living in sin and idolatry and okay with it. Father, bring us back to where we need to be. Convict our hearts today and work in our hearts as you see fit for whatever each person needs. But of course, our top priority is salvation. I pray that if, if there's someone today who's not saved, today would be the day. They would confess Jesus is Lord. Because they've learned today they're without excuse. There's no reason not to. I pray all these things in Jesus' name.